Tonight's presentation from us is the Cathay Pacific Carbon Terminal. Very happy to see Ian Hunt is here, he's a project manager, Jeremy is a design manager, and Michelle is the lead architect. We've been working on this project pretty much secretly for two and a half years. It's only in the last couple of months we're allowed to go around and tell people what we're actually doing due to the nature of the project and the sensitivity. This is, without a doubt, one of the largest adoptions of BIM technology anywhere in the world. The building is, as you can see, rather large, and I'll explain how big it is as we go through it. The cargo terminal is designed with a capacity of 2.6 million tons of cargo per annum. A cargo plane, this is a silver bullet on the screen, a cargo plane carries 110 tons of cargo. A passenger plane will take about 20 tons, 25 tons of cargo. What I learned when I started working on this project, cargo was split 50-50 between the passenger fleet and the cargo fleet. So every time you go down to Bangkok for your holidays or you go back to London to see your kids' university, you're bringing 20 tons of cargo with you and it's going to be going through this terminal. Hong Kong International Airport. The yellow block indicates where it is at the south end of the actual platform. It's pretty much sandwiched in between the existing Haxel terminal and the existing Asia Air Freight terminal. The building site itself is 110,000 square meters. Our building, constructed floor area, is nearly 250,000 square meters. That's the same size as the International Commerce Center currently under construction in Kowloon. So this is a, a very large but very flat building. Now, our story about how we came to be, at the very beginning of the design consultancy, the brains that are in Cathay Pacific decided that doing a BIM model would be the right approach for the design coordination. So in the design documentation for, for the actual designers, it was required that the design team use BIM processes for design integration. Meinhardt, IDAS, WT and ourselves formed a team and we won the bid to design this building using BIM and other skills. The objectives, first and foremost, to save time. This is a very, a very aggressive program. We're going to build a quarter of a million square meters of floor in less than nine months. We have to produce a fully coordinated design, clash free. We have to produce consistent design construction drawings. So we're using the technology to produce architectural drawings, structural drawings, and MEP drawings from a fully coordinated model. And as with all good Hong Kong clients, they don't want to spend too much money. So what is a cargo handling system and how does it work? Very, very briefly, the cargo system is basically a very extensive arrangement of machines that move six-ton pallets around in kind of lateral directions. We have modeled every single element of the equipment. We've modeled all of the systems, the cargo pallets that are actually moving around, and we have also modeled all the space requirements. Inside the building, we've got vehicles that are moving around. We've had to model the envelopes, the kinetic envelopes of all the equipment. So we're not just modeling physical objects, we're also modeling space in which objects are moving. Our project, this is a, a section through the 3D model. We have allocated names to the floors of the terminal as CT1 through CT7, i.e. cargo terminal 1 through 7. It allows us to track all the objects in the computer model. A very quick overview of the terminal. At ground floor, the building is about 400 meters by 280 meters in plan. The ground floor is the interface between the terminal and the airport. So as the, the cargo is being delivered to the planes, it's all coming out of the ground floor of the building. You can see a picture in the bottom corner of a, a truck dolly with the cargo pallets. These pallets that you can see behind the truck, they're the same size as a Honda MPV car, and they weigh about six tons each. These are not small pieces of equipment. The level above is CT2. CT2 is basically a holding area or a buffer zone for holding cargo. So as the planes are ready to go, they hold the cargo and they can very quickly get them to the plane. CT3 is the first level of the building where you actually have people working there. CT3 is an operational area where they break down and, and move, maneuver cargo. Above CT3 is a mezzanine where we move around the small parcels. The parcels are again are just individual units that move around. We have modeled all of the steels required to support those, all the hangers which keep clashing with the ducts, all the fire sprinkler systems that go through all those pallets, and we have all the hoists going up and down to the building. So the, the 3D model is finding both clashes with physical objects and clashes with moving objects. On the roof, we have a, a very large open space. Uh, we're going to build a few basketball courts and a few volleyball courts for the summer, and then we're going to store empty aluminium ULD cans. Now this is the fun bit. How are we doing this BIM model? We have four different teams all working together and all of the information has been put together in 3D. We're not working off drawings, we're working off 3D models. We have Siemens doing the cargo handling system. They have a team of about four or five people in Germany building 3D CAD models. We have a team from Meinhardt Structured Engineers of about 10 people working on the design and the modeling. 
We have a team from IDAS of about the same size, 12 people, working on the design and the modeling. And we have a, a Meinhardt MEP team putting together all the MEP in 3D. Now we'll just show you some quick snapshots of the individual models. This is a structural model. This is a precast concrete frame. The beams are only 21 meters long in the primary direction, and they're only 17 meters long in the secondary direction. So we're going to bring them in on our shoulders off the back of the barge. The steel here is about 30 meters tall. The architectural model, the architectural model is basically wrapped around the structural model. So the architect and the structural engineering team are working collaboratively together, so there's no duplication in the model. If you see a structural slab, it's either a structural slab or it's an architectural slab. We don't have two of the same thing. And this is a very quick example. This is one snapshot of one office area. So if I click, if I'm working inside Revit, if I click on the model, get this to work, if I click on the model, the red is a structural model, but this is the interface that the architect is working with. So the architect can see what the structural engineer is doing pretty much in a live environment. This is the fun part. This building has got some very, very extensive building services. This building is not air conditioned. It is naturally ventilated, or sorry, mechanically ventilated for a greater part. But there's a very, very extensive smoke extract system. So we have a dual purpose ductwork system. So in, in a normal operating, it's ventilating space. In a worst case scenario fire, it's an, an emergency smoke extract system. If you can imagine thousands and thousands of motors moving around hundreds and hundreds of cargo pallets, we need quite a lot of electricity. We need, in this case, 22 transformers in the actual building project, and we have 12 backup gener emergency generators. So we're going to drink quite a lot of electricity. The fire sprinkler system is extensive. We have a drencher system and we have a fire sprinkler system. We have very, very large spaces which cannot be fire protected in natural ways or normal ways, so we're using a drencher system. And if we have a drainage system, we have to have a drainage system in case the drainages just happen to go off on a Sunday afternoon. So we've got a very extensive pipework system for the drainage. You put all this together, and you end up with some very, very complicated combined services models. And when you look over the shoulder of the team working on these CAD files, this is some of the stuff you see on a daily basis. These are large ducts. Some of these are four and a half to by five meters in size. Very large diameter pipes and very, very large cable cable containment and bus bars. Very, very detailed flash analysis. We have a, a matrix set up. We have basically set up an analysis model to check every individual system against every other system to meet specific, specific requirements for the operation of the, the terminal. So on the immediate left-hand side is the operational requirements, headrooms for truck movements, headrooms for actual forklift maneuvers. Then we have the cargo handling system, which is priority. Then we have the structure. Then we have the architecture. And last but not least, we have the MEP. We're working through 67 scenarios on eight different levels of the building. And we're working through it on a continual basis. We have one member of our team, and all he does is clash analysis. Sometimes we see these kind of situations. The, the brown envelope is an, a kinetic envelope for a moving piece of equipment. The clash analysis software told us we had a clash with the structure. We had to redesign some of the structure, and we had to position, reposition some of the kinetic, kinetic envelope. Clash analysis showed us clashes between the steel work required for the material handling system and these very small four meter wide by three meter deep structural beams. The other thing the clash analysis software showed us was the envelopes for the ULDs. We were clashing with the walls. All of these clashes I'm showing you we discovered over the last three or four months. They have all now been designed out of the building. We have five different sets of documentation, 2D background drawings for people who are not involved directly with the 3D model, 3D backgrounds for different disciplines who are working in 3D, clash analysis models, and record copies of the 3D model at every two or three week intervals. From that, we're producing 3,000 contract documents. We're now working on a 4D model, so we're not satisfied doing 3D, we have to do 4D. We're linking the construction program to the, the BIM model. So we're now looking at construction sequences, construction systems, cranage locations, and we've, we're now looking at how we're going to get the contractor to plan out day by day, week by week, their activities on site using this 3D model. We anticipate that we're going to have a lot less RFIs from the contractors during the construction stage, simply be through better design and better coordination. We're not expecting Cathay to turn around and make some serious changes halfway through the job when they realize what the building might look like. So we're pretty confident there's going to be very, very few change orders. We have yet to determine what construction cost savings are available, but given the high prices of materials and the efficiency through which we're doing design, we're confident we can save money directly through construction costs. And we know that the BIM where we've been able to complete detailed design in a much shorter time frame than we normally would doing 2D traditional methods. And by using the 4D over the next coming six to nine months, we're pretty confident we can get this job finished on time.